Mark Skay, thank you very, very much for your time. I know we're not necessarily on track at the moment, but that doesn't mean that you're not extremely busy. So we're here to chat about the season where this break is a great opportunity for us to look back at where we've been and see who's doing well, who's not, and obviously get your incredible insights because you're at the front seat of all of it, really. So I thought we'd start at the top. Shane Van Gisbergen, the guy's dominant. It's 11 wins. There were six in a row. We thought at one point there was nothing that could stop him. So what's your assessment of Shane's season so far? Well, I think there's a few things that you have to take out of it. I think in terms of starting a season with that level of dominance, I haven't seen that for a long time. I mean, that is a combination of the form that he brought into the year, the, the racing that he did in the off season, the driving that he was doing, the ability to come straight out and put a real stamp on this championship was uh, was extraordinary. And if you think really through the course of that period of time, to have the collarbone injury probably just it almost put a bigger wow factor on it you know nobody anticipated at sandown that he would actually even start you know we bill crompton and i were standing at the end of pit lane and, and we basically said mate put the white flag up and and get out of this because we were worried that it was probably going to make the injury worse and any threat of going off the road or in, into the fence for instance would have made the injury worse so um to get through that weekend with that level of resilience was just extraordinary. And, and the domination that he's shown through the course of 2021, I mean, as I said, I've been watching and and studying this game for a long, long time, right back into, you know, Brock and Moffat days. Not many times in our history have we seen someone come out and do what he's done. We've seen there has some weekends, like at the Bend, it just wasn't a really a, a Red Bull Ample racing weekend for them. However, we have seen the tide turn a little bit with Cameron Waters bringing the fight to him, especially in the second Townsville. So do you think that Cameron's the only man that might be able to take it to SVG? Well, I think his teammate beat him in Tasmania for the first time. So that was the first time that, you know, the, that run uh, was broken and and it was a nice bounce back for wink up at a place that he's been very good at over the years so for wink up to beat his teammate that was finally a, a time where we all went you know wow there's a there's a chance to, to knock svg off and probably from a jamie wink up you know final full-time year of driving that would have been a bit of pep in his step just to go i i can actually beat the kiwi who's uh who's been smashing me alongside me in the garage. So that would have been a good thing for him. I think to your point around Cameron, I think the the two best drives of, of anybody else other than Van Gisbergen this year is the tail and bend drive of Cam Waters to hold off Shane. And that level of resistance was really strong. You know, that, that was a day where he needed to beat him and he did. And the same thing applies in Townsville. You know, the final race of Townsville 2 was a you know a really hardcore battle between those two guys. They've raced, you know, they've raced really hard on lots of occasions. You know, if you cast your mind back to Bathurst last year, for instance, that was another example of that. But that was a time when, if you think, and why I was particularly impressed with Townsville two, was that at Townsville one they got completely smashed. You know, that they, they were lapped. They were nowhere near it. So to come out at the following weekend be far more competitive and then take it in a, in a dead set dog fight with the two of them on the Sunday was uh, was a great trial. I find what's interesting, we had a bit of chatter around, well, you know, Shane's only doing so well because Scott McLaughlin's not here anymore. Like, what's your response to that? Do you think that's true? You'd be unwise to say that Shelby Power would be going better if a Scott McLaughlin wasn't parked in there. So they, they would definitely be further up the road than what they are now. And that's not in any way denigrating the performance of Will Davison and Anton De Pasquale. I think Scott picked that car up and carried it. And there were occasions last year where the car probably wasn't as good as we thought it was, but Scott's um, ability to, and, and the report with Ludo 
was such that they made that car better on weekends than probably what the real performance was. And I, and I make the point because it was really where Fabian was versus where Scott was is probably where the car really, in terms of its outright performance, was really located in the field. And even if you go back to Bathurst last year, even with Scott McLaughlin on board, they weren't fast enough to win. So they weren't in the race. So I think they went backwards a little bit with the car at the end of last year. They then put two new drivers in the cars and it's unfair for you to arrive in a car specification that probably wasn't as good as we thought and then make comparisons with Scott McLaughlin. You know, Scott was absolutely dominant across those three years and what we it's a bit of a travesty in some ways we've probably just lost a significant rivalry that van gisbergen was going to have with scott so look, i i think a long-winded answer to your question is yes scott would be further up the road yes there'd be a bigger battle between red bull and shelby power racing and and yes the speed differential that shane's had at the start of the year has been bigger and more not just in lap time but consistency has been bigger than it would have been if scott was in one of those red mustangs and then looking to the other side of the red bull and paul garage there's definitely another big year for jamie winker his final full-time driving year we still see that hunger we saw them battle it out in townsville yes they probably got a little bit told off in the garage after that but you know we enjoyed watching that do you think he's still able to you know flip the switch and say okay now i am a driver now is he still able to give that everything he's got 100 percent. i mean we've seen some of the laps some of his laps the the pole position that he got at uh, townsville was just fantastic as good if not the best lap of the weekend. I mean, I know that Van Gisbergen did a similar time and they both, you know, gapped the field by roughly three tenths of a second. So both of those laps were extraordinary. So that shows there's no doubt about hunger. I mean, one of the things that people get, they're just offside with and they just don't understand. And and, and think about this with Jim Richards and Peter Brock. Peter Brock led Bathurst uh, at 53 years of age. And his first, his first retirement in 1997 when I drove with him he led the race at the start of the race, broke the lap record at 53. Jim Richards won the race with me when he was 55. In fact, when he was 56, the following year in 2003, he outqualified me when I was the champion. He outqualified me at Bathurst. So you don't just wake up one morning and you can't drive. I mean, you, it's just, you, if you're still motivated and you still want to do it and you apply yourself the way that those two examples of, of Brock and Richards are, you can do it for a lot longer than Jamie Jamie Winkup or how, however long I, I drive for. You can do it for a lot longer than that. So it's it's not a circumstance where you just wake up one morning and go, oh, I, I can't drive the car. The circumstance around Jamie is, can I apply my brain, I prepare myself the same way as I've always done, and dedicate all the time, energy, resource? This this is a live sleep eat and breathe sport this this is if you want to be the best at it and you want to be the complete racing driver there's not a second of the day you're not dedicated to to how do i make this thing go faster or how do i make me go faster so there's this there's, there's this constant grapple with going better and better and better you can't have the sort of tenure the time frame that he's had at the top of this sport without being 100 percent committed to it and that's what he's been fantastic at so it begs the question of what kind of a person is going to be able to fulfill this seat next year but none of us know we know there's a list we know there's international names we know there's local names and we obviously know the name brock feeney he is the favorite to take the seat so what's your thoughts on that dynamic i guess if it was to be brock lining up against shane being a young guy do you think that he could be the best person to fill it? Look, I, I think if you had to to um, assess his performances so far and the way he's driven in Super 2, he, he's going very, very well. Um, and you'd have to say that he has the makings of someone who can definitely be at the, at the pointy end of the field. It's probably too early, to be fair, um, to assess whether he is the right one to fill a seven-time champion's shoes. Um, and and I think that we've seen, whether it's been Mostert or Cam Waters or Mark Winterbottom or uh, Nick Perkett or Scott Pye, 
who've come through the development series and when you lob into the main game there is a serious step up there's a serious level that changes week in week out that if you want to just step up and run in the middle or the back of the field then that, that's probably reasonably easy but to step up and be in a similar spot that you've been in in super two and step up to the pointy end of our main game whew, that's a, that's a big that's a big change and and you don't know that until you get there so i'm not in any way saying that brock hasn't got the potential to do it all i'm saying is that will be a big step and what it does is it mostly lands you next to Shane week in, week out. And, you know, I don't think there's a young driver on the planet that at some point hasn't come into a team and had to look across the garage and go, gee, they're going well. Now, for me, as a young bloke, you know, Jim Richards was was that for me. He was the best touring car driver in the world. I would argue that that would be a similar scenario. I don't reckon there'd be few better drivers in the world in a touring car right now than Shane Van Gisbergen. In fact, I'd put him in the top three or four straight away. So if you if you think as a young bloke coming in that that's not going to be awe inspiring and not going to be a difficult task, then you're kidding yourself. So it's it's an interesting, interesting dilemma. Um, I, I think there's also a lot of other stuff in the background. You know, what's what's Roland's role in this? You know, what's he what's he doing around it? Um, how much say is Jamie having in it? How much say is the key team people? You know, Mark Dutton, Jeremy Moore, David Couchy, you know, what's being said in the background as to how you go about this next recruitment? And what's the team looking for? What's it, you know, would would a young bloke with not much experience be the right person? Or, or are you looking for someone who's got more credentials already and then bring that young bloke through and continue to run him maybe maybe in a in a, a third car like they did with Lowndes. i mean i don't know what the background thinking is it's an interesting it's an interesting thing when you've got you know the leading team and you've got a seven time champion leaving that seat you know when the music stops it's going to be interesting to see who's in the chair but let's extend it out to the rest of the supercars field now so who has surprised you this year? Who's gone a little bit better than you thought they might? Uh, I think probably Will Brown is one of the guys that I've been really impressed with. I think he's done a really good job. Um, I think overall there's been some peaks and troughs and some things that we've seen that have surprised me with uh, Anton De Pasquale, for instance, having three poles in a row. That was, you know, that was obviously a really good um, period of time in terms of pace for him at Tail and Bend. Um, I think the battle between Winkup Waters and Mostert is interesting. Um, I know when you're racing for second, it doesn't really make that so appealing, but the battle between them is really good. Um, I've been really encouraged by some of the progress, you know, the your Tickford scenario and your marketing line, I, I like that one, but Tickford have definitely stepped up. Um, so have Walkinshaw and Dreddy United. Um, I think the consistency of Will Davison's been good. I think the glimpses of pace from Nick Perkat's been good. Um, I really like the start of the season for Mark Winterbottom and then they've sort of found a way to be in the wrong spot at the wrong time. And their, their, their performance in qualifying is not good enough. So there's, there's a lot going on in behind you know the standout performer of Van Gisberg, and there's a lot going on within the championship. I mean, I, I, I've really enjoyed it. I mean, I, I think the quality of racing that, that race at Sandown was one of the best races I've seen for a long, long time. Uh, and then so was the racing at, at Townsville. I, I, I think, you know, we've we've got a pretty. I, I think one of the things, Charlie, and we don't we don't credit ourselves enough in terms of domestic motorsport here and what it what it looks like versus the rest of the world. You know, we we have got pound for pound, dollar for dollar, the best touring car race, racing in the world. Absolutely, the best touring car racing in the world. And when you look at how close the field is, when you watch the cars, when you see their dynamics, I mean, the vision, for instance, you know, when we watch 
the very best drivers of these cars, driving them right at the knife edge, you know, they're, they're exhilarating. And if you compare it with other motorsport around the world, um, and if you ask people just independent to us, they rave about the sport and they rave about how good it is. So, you know, we, we're, we're pretty lucky in some ways, you know, there's, there's although we, we, you know, we, we have fans sometimes, you know, blueing about dominance of certain teams at certain times. And we always have the emotion around parody and we always have all this stuff. It's only because people care. It's only because we, we love it and it's, and it's, you know, top of mind. So, um, you know, I, I think we've, we've got a, a pretty cool season other than the Van Gisberg and dominance. You're right. There's so much playing out in this season and so much to be excited about. And I think that all of the different guys, and, and you're saying there are like tents separating this field. I, the racing is closer than what I've probably ever seen in a long time. And yeah, I think that we're, we're definitely in for an amazing back end of the season. Which brings me to Phillip Island. It's back on the calendar this year. And I want to get your take on this because it's the fast flowing corners. It's something that Mustangs have gone quite well at. Will we see maybe a resurgence of Kelly Grove Racing like we did at the Bend? What's your take on who's going to go well at Phillip Island? Well, there's a, there's a couple of things in that question. First thing is, it's great for supercars and superbikes to be down there. It's great that the Australian Grand Prix Corporation has been able to grab that MotoGP weekend and make it into a motorsport festival. So the Bass Coast area, Phillip Island has been massively affected by COVID and, and the tourism and hospitality uh, issues associated with that. So great for the Grand Prix to be able to do that. Sean Seymour and the team and Shane Howard have been able to do a deal there, which is, which is fantastic for supercars to be back there. I think if you ask every driver in the field, other than Bathurst, the next best racetrack is Phillip Island. So we love it. So big, fast corners, European style place. Um, so great and great for motor sport, motor, motor sport fans to be able to grab a, a MotoGP weekend and see the bikes down there too. So that's at the surface of it. Kudos to everybody. Well done. Second thing about that is, um, Phillip Island is so hard on tyres and it's so difficult to make the car good at that I think you're going to see a few things just pop up that might not be in line with what we've seen. Of, of all the tracks that we've gone to this year so far, probably Bathurst is only really the, uh, the only guide. Um, so that was a dominant display at the start, as we know from Shane. But we also know that Bathurst last year, there were four or five cars that were probably fast enough to take it to to the lead guys so there's going to be a scenario around making a cut the car qualify well there and make it um from a driver commitment perspective get the best from yourself in the car for that one lap but making the tire live most difficult place in australia so there'll be um you know quite a lot of head scratching at that time of the year also it's going to be warm um you know it's it's a place um, that changes every time you go there. So even since the last time we raced there, the character of the place will have changed because it's in that next to the ocean and then gets exposed pretty heavily to the weather extremes, you know, year in, year out. Um, I, I think, you know, one of the things I didn't cover before when you asked me about some of the things that have come out of the year, Andre Heimgartner, for instance, getting his first win, I thought that was just, you know, fantastic. And, and for that win at Tail and Ben, that was sort of out of the blue. And what you said when you're introing the question, I think is actually really valid. You might get somebody like a David Reynolds or Andre Heimgartner that um, is able to make the tire live and therefore they'll be, you know, higher up the field than you'd think. So I don't really know what will happen to be honest, which I, which I really like. I, I think the prospect of us going there and not knowing, you know, the, the prospect of some jeopardy going to a place like that is is always intriguing and I'm looking forward to Philip Island. And just finally, we did touch on Will Brown and how impressed you have been with him this year. And then looking at the other rookies, because we've got quite a field of them. We've got Brody Kostecki, Zane Goddard. Brody's had a win. Zane Goddard's been in the top 10 shootout, as has Will Brown. Are you surprised by the level at which these rookies are operating in their first year? Yeah, look... It's funny, I think it's a cruel term, the rookie term, because they're clearly not rookies, right? So um, I know that they're in their first year and that meets the, re the requirement around our definition of, of rookie, but they're far from rookies. Um, Will Brown's done a lot of racing in all different categories. I love the way he goes about it. 
he's got a smile on his face. He loves his car racing and, and he, you can tell that he's getting better and better and better and he will be a future champion. He's, he's very good. Brody Kostecki's drive at Sandon in the wet was extraordinary. Um, he's, he's displaying some real toughness at the starts of the races. Um, I, I think he's also got a very big future and he was very good in America. You know, Paul Morris actually sent me a sort of dossier of his success in the States as a young bloke. And I was really surprised by how much racing he'd done and the sorts of success that he enjoyed throughout that period. So I, I think to be fair, both those guys have done more racing and they're, they're a bit more credentialed than the rookie terminology. Young Zane Goddard, I, I'm interested in because he's shown some real glimpses of pace for Matt Stone Racing. And I think also he's got a bright future. Um, I felt so sorry for him in that top 10 shootout when he got both pedals or he missed the break and, and speared off at the final corner because at that point he was actually going to be the fastest in the top 10 shootout. So. As I said, there's been glimpses of, of speed and, you know, to your point, is that a surprise? Yes, it probably is. I, I think any time that you get, you know, a young bloke um, who I didn't expect to be in the top 10 that day, um, not only in in the 10, but actually going to forge his way forward in the 10 uh, was outstanding. And, and you know, that's the same thing. I mean, we saw that with Todd Hazelwood. I, I love that lap on old tyres that he did, for instance. Um, that arguably could have been the best top 10 shootout lap of the year when you put used tyres on and you bounce yourself to the front of the field. So, you know, that's there's, there's, there's been a lot of people that have played a much bigger role in this year's championship than the ones we've covered so far. And that's why I'm really enthused for the last five race meetings, but, but especially Phillip Island and especially Bathurst. On Super Archive on Sunday, we're premiering the 2002 Bathurst 1000 which I just get excited and I think my palms start to sweat when I talk about this <laughs> because it's your incredible race. We had not only the, the plastic bag just conspiracy going on, we had you defying team orders just to put it flat and you knew you were going to get there and you said, no, I've, I've got this, guys. But I've heard you say before it's one of your favourite moments with the Golden Child. So can you tell us a bit about it from your perspective? Well, the first thing is I'll definitely be Sunday tuning in because I, I, I love it. Um, it's a it's a race that had lots of potential outcomes and there were real battles going on within the field. And it was it was so windy that that's why all the plastic bags were everywhere. And, and earlier in the race, the plastic bags put Craig Lowndes car, Craig and Neil Crompton were driving together. And just a really quick shout out to Crompo. I know there's been so much um, comment and so many questions and so much concern for his health and it's fantastic to i've spoken to him many many times and he's on the road back to recovery he's going really well he's riding his mountain bike and he's going for walks and he's he's back to uh to going well again so um can't wait to see young neil back in uh in our commentary box and hosting for us um so there was a really cool race and then at the back of it there was this mad piece of of uh, sort of final sprint to the end where I had to get by Stephen Richards and I had to get clear because if I stayed behind him, the car wouldn't have finished. So I needed to get to the front clear, trying to win Australia's biggest race. And uh, when I got there, it was overheating pretty badly. And uh, in those days, we had a reset switch on the, on the dash. So every three degrees, it would reset itself. And so the last thing I saw was, I think it was 117 degrees and I just kept on pressing reset. And the guys, the guys in the pit could see those numbers and they're telling me, you know, you know, less rev, still all the things which I was all, always doing. And then finally, you know, there was this, these question marks around, you know, maybe we should bring it in or whatever. And I firmly said over the radio, stopped talking and that was it. Uh, didn't listen to another radio message and uh, we're able to get the car home. So uh, for Jim Richards and I, that was 10 years after he had that fi that famous rendition on the podium, and I won't swear, so uh, we all know what he said in 1992. But in 2002, he got up there and he called them a pack of wonderful people. So it was a great thing for Jimmy to do and, and for, uh, for his career to win Bathurst at 55 was just fantastic. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time, Mark Scaife. I truly appreciate it. Your insights, as always, like an hour with you would not be even close to enough. So thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Much appreciated.